What's up and welcome to Idol Insights, a show where each week I, Trevor Best, talk to interesting people about Idol Champions and Dungeons and Dragons. And joining me this week is returning guest Ryan Harbin. Hello! <laughs> yes. How's it going? Yay. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> uh, right, if folks in the chat don't know who you are, who are you for those fine folks who do not know? I am the vice president at Penny Arcade. Uh, mostly I run PAX is my big day-to-day, -day, but I handle a lot of our content and things that come out of the office here at PA. The, the, the big wig. <laughs> Some kind of wig. <laughs> Some kind of wig. I like that. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, we're, we're going to be talking a bit about uh, Dinar uh, 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 this week. Dinar had recently got a, uh, a glitch skin. Uh, yeah. So uh, we're, we're, we're talking about the everybody's uh, favorite dragonborn that vomits up acid. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, and, but, uh, you know, last time you, you, you were on the show, I asked you and Chris, you know, how you got into D and D and that was, you know, C team, like you, you all made characters for that. What I did, I, I, I this week, this time's uh icebreaker question. I want to ask, did, have you made another character since then? Do you have a second character that you've made? Uh, I had one other character that I've done since C team, uh, and it wasn't very long lasting. I, um, I had a friend that uh, I grew up with back home, back in Philly. And he really wanted to get into D&D. &D. So he asked me to join his game. And he was brand new to it. I've only played one game of D&D. &D. It was C-Team. I've played, <laughs> played one game. It's been recorded for posterity. I've never really played in another extended campaign of it. Okay. So we played a handful of games. I mean, it was just, it was a victim of everyone's schedules. Oh, yeah. Kind of the greatest schedules. evil one. <laughs> yeah. But we got through like, you know, I want to say like 10, 12 games before it collapsed. That's yeah. good. That's a good amount of games, though. Yeah. What 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 did you what did you make for that character? Oh, I made um, I made a oh god, what was he? He was like a I'm gonna butcher it. It was I, I in fact I could probably look him up. Um, he was like a water, <laughs> he was a water based um, wasn't an elf? What was he? The Genasi. Yeah. Yeah, and, the, the elemental people. And he was well, it was like a. God, now I gotta look it up. He was, uh, <laughs> but basically, he was all like Philly tropes. So his, <laughs> name was, his name was Wooder because that's how they pronounce water in Philly. Um, Some water. Yeah, and his like he had a, a trident, and then I called it Tasty Cakes, and like, <laughs> I was just trying to drop like as many dumb references as I could. He was like a reverse pirate, so he like lived in the water. And then, like, would travel on land, but he would always want to get back to water, and he would, like, raid while he was on land and stuff. <laughs> Instead of being, like, a pirate who lives yeah. on land and then goes out in the water, so it was just a flip of that. Yeah. It was very dumb. <laughs> I, I don't know. I like that. that that's a, that's a yeah. lot more thought than I, I know some people have put into characters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do like the name Wooder. Wooder was really good. That's a good name. That's yeah. a really good name. Yeah. <laughs> water genasi water <laughs> yeah. it was fun uh but that's been the only one i've had a couple games i've wanted to do i really so i've only dm'd one game we did oh. um, an offshoot like a one shot uh of um c team where i dm'd and the group had to find dinar dinar had been kidnapped and they had to go get him um and it was very silly and it was very dumb and um i kind of I, I think Mike and I have very similar sensibilities. We have very similar sense of humor, and I think we both approach things in a very similar way. Mm -hmm. um, we make a lot of the same jokes. Um, but, like, when he DMs, he likes to, like, set up subsystems and subgames. And I did the same oh. thing. So when we played this game, I made a whole secondary game where it was basically, like, Iron Chef. And they had to, like, take these ingredients and, like, cook a meal for this king. And the whole reason Dinar was kidnapped because he heard that Dinar was like a great chef. Yeah. So it's like to get him back, they had to like cook this meal and then he judged them all. Um, and it was fun. And I wanted to do like a return to that and like do it again at some point. We keep saying we're going to record it at some point. Maybe this year we'll record it. That I mean, that game in itself sounds pretty awesome. My my wife has wanted to do a uh, a D and D adventure that was all about cooking for a couple years now. Yeah. <laughs> this was really fun. It was like. I, the game I built was basically like a push your luck mechanic sort of thing. So there was all these ingredients face down. Like it said what the ingredient was and they were mm -hmm. all dumb puns. It was like tractor bean and like weird dumb stuff like that. And then on the back it would have a number and you basically had to roll 
and you had to like pick the order that you wanted to roll and try to keep beating the numbers and the higher the number the harder it is to beat but the once it's cooked it like added more points and it was a it was a silly little game the one thing i did learn in testing that was i showed it to kiko before i did it because i was like so proud of it mm -hmm. and i was like this is it took all this time and he was like this is really cool you should be proud you designed a game uh that's the problem he's like they're already playing a game you this is too complicated <laughs> they got to play a game within a game they're thinking about other stuff you got to dumb this down and i did i took his advice and i didn't listen enough to it i dumbed it down and i should have streamlined it even more because mm -hmm. when we were playing i'm like explaining like 10 different rules and they're like we're also trying to match or like keep track of the story and what we're doing and so it's like all right it was a good note it was a good note. When you introduce a game within D and D, keep it, dumb it down because a game within a game is a lot to to handle. Yeah, I I, I think the there's an example of that. I think that's really good in in like pre written games. The Tomb of Annihilation has a a dinosaur race, and I think all of my players were like getting ready to like roll stats on a dinosaur and like get ready for every single move. I'm like, no, 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 that's not how we're doing this. Yeah. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna roll a die and it's gonna see how it goes. <laughs> no, that's the way to do it. And I was like, no, no, this should be. I kept I kept adding stuff to it, and that's really you got to take stuff away. You got to make it baseline. Yeah. Uh, well, and, and I remember, uh, you are saying Mike is very similar in that. I remember his uh, Battle Royale game uh, that he yeah. did on stage. And he he had a lot of extra mechanics to it, but it was stuff that it felt right for that sort of yeah. situation. And he, did a, uh, and he did a Wizard Kart, which was just Mario Kart, but he did it as like a card game. And that, he did a really good job with that because it leaned into our powers. So mm. like walnut could use thorn whip to like grab another cart and pull it and it's like it like you could you could use your character abilities inside of the game he built which was very clever that's pretty cool and i and i didn't play these other ones but i've seen ones he did where he had one where it was like um mario uh odyssey uh where it was all the little planets and he made mm. little planets and then the figures could like jump and then the gravity would pull you to another one and he made like game mechanics for that and I, I never played it, but I saw the models he made for it. It was pretty cool. That's like, awesome. Yeah. yeah. You're now you're now making me want to pitch to C and E and be like, hey, so we do an idle game. Let's do a D and D cart racer now. <laughs> it went really well. You should watch the episode. Like it went. Pretty I'll have to well. check that out. That sounds it freaking was good. awesome. <laughs> I know. I was like, we should like write it up and just put it out there for people. Heck and yeah. And also then because it's like Mike is like a really talented artist. He's like, all right, I need art for this. Well, I'll just draw it. So then he makes these like great cards and stuff. And I'm like, oh, man. Oh, to have that artistic talent. I, know. <laughs> I have to commission that sort of thing. Yeah, right? <laughs> no one cares if I write a pretty paragraph. They're not going to yeah. look at that the same way. <laughs> Uh, all right, well, let's let's talk a bit about uh, Dinar. Uh, if if folks are watching today, they missed you know the last episode you were on. They're fresh to the game. Who is Dinar for those people? Yeah, Dinar is a dragonborn who is part of a subgroup within Acquisitions Inc. called the C Team. Um, he is. I always described him as. Uh, I mean, he's he's of royal lineage, but he left his uh, city. And I always describe him as a as like the kid who like leaves for college and like reinvents himself. <laughs> OK, <laughs> <And> like, totally. <laughs> like once he meets a new group, he's like, none of these people know me, so I can say I'm whatever. Uh, so he's very immature. He's very dumb. Uh, he's intentionally dumb so that. Uh, while I was playing, I could learn, or uh, as I was learning the game as I was playing, if I ever messed anything up, it was like in character. <laughs> like, yeah. It was like a safety blanket for me. It's like, oh, I rolled wrong. Well, my character's an idiot. So that's, <laughs> it's not a bug, it's a feature. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I, I, th I honestly think that's a pretty fair way to play. Uh, yeah. Making my first D&D &D character try to be super clever was not not the good way to do it oh, at yeah, all no. <laughs> no, make him dumb as a brick <laughs> it's so easy <laughs> um so so tell me tell me about c team you know is, is if i haven't seen or known anything about that what what, what is this group that dinar found himself with um yeah so this was a game we played for 
five years, uh, give or take. I don't know, because it happened around the pandemic. Yeah. I always lose track of how many years we actually played. <laughs> the um, years feel like they don't count, but they do, I know, unfortunately. Where I'm like, <laughs> yeah, we did play in 2020 a bit, and then we did came after, so it's like, yeah. Um, But yeah, this was, uh, Jerry always said this was a, uh, this was the story he wanted to write about uh, Omen. A lot of like what this group does is like uh, kind of background into into Omen's character. Um, and uh, he said this was always the story he wanted to tell. And he just ended up <laughs> uh, adapting it to the game. Uh, and it worked well. It was great. It was a lot of fun. He was a great DM. Uh, and uh, and we still talk all the time, too. Like me, I got a chat going with all with Chris and Kate and Tris all the time. And and we want to do more one offs. I'm like, mm. Our schedules are rough because it's like, I've always got a pack. So that's going to always going to pull me and Jerry and Tris is at Watsy and Kate is at a game studio. So it's like getting all of our schedules to line up is, is hard. I'm mm -hmm. honestly looking back. So surprised that we were able to hit like a weekly show for like, <laughs> for like 30, 40 weeks a year, like yeah. know, for a couple of years. I'm like, how did we do that? It was, it was easy for me because it was like the studio is right next door, but I'm like, I'm so surprised everyone was you know, like drove in and everything it was crazy that we were able to, I, I'm really impressed that we were able to execute what we did. Um, and I still want to do go back and play some games, but yeah, but we were just a ragtag group. It was a spinoff of our acquisitions main series. And um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. A bunch of dumb kids being dumb. <laughs> I, I've I've now gotten to talk to the the like the entire cast over the course of uh over the this year or I guess you know in the last couple months because this year's still starting I don't remember what time is chat chat this year is weird um yeah. but uh it it has been so interesting hearing like how all of y'all came together uh like from from Kate just being like yeah I know Jerry just walked up to me it was just like you want to be in a show <laughs> yeah it was crazy so like. Uh, when we first uh, started the show, like, it's really weird. So when I started, because I've been working on PAX for 12 years, but I actually wasn't mm -hmm. working at, I've only been working at Penny Arcade for like seven. So like for the first five years I was on PAX, we do PAX with a partner called Reed Exhibitions. They're like an event company. And um, there are partners on the show and they do New York Comic Con and they do Star Wars Celebration. They do a bunch of stuff. And uh, I worked on that side of the fence. And then uh, after Robert left, Mike and Jerry asked me to kind of jump over on this side. So once I jumped over to the Penny Arcade side, and also that speaks to the relationship of the companies when they're yeah. like, we don't care. Just keep packs running. We don't care. Yeah. Um, so uh, once I came over here, I was like, hey, this was never my place because I was just kind of the packs guy. But if like now I'm in here, uh, you should be streaming more. We should be doing more stuff with AI, Ack Inc., just doing one show at every PAX is great, but like we should be doing more acting content. As an Ack like, fan, I appreciate you for saying that. Yeah, <laughs> it like, seems like low hanging fruit, guys. So we started acting on it. And uh, part of the reason we wanted to do C Team, I initially kept calling it, uh, I was calling it Ack Inc. Miami, like CSI Miami. I was like, <laughs> yeah. I was like, we got to do a spin off. Sunglasses. <laughs> yeah, I was like, we got to do a spin off. And because my plan was initially, I was like, we should take Ack Inc. on tour. So like in the summer between shows, what if we did like a five city tour or something like that? And But I'm like, Mike and Jerry and like getting like celebrity friends yeah. to commit to that is hard. Yeah. So I was like, let's do a spinoff show so that we have established characters in the universe so we can swap in people and fans won't feel like ripped off, right? So it's like, hey, I once... Once Chris is established as a character in universe, then if he shows up, it doesn't feel like weird. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so that was kind of the impetus for it. And then when we were putting the cast together and I was talking to Jerry, um, yeah, he was like, cause I was just kind of like building it behind the scenes. I was, I didn't want to be on it. I don't like being on camera. And uh, Hi. I'm struggling with this right now as we speak. So uh, uh, he was like, you should be on it because we, the reason it works well the first time was because Mike had never played mm -hmm. and we need a character who's never played so that the audience, anyone who jumps in and they've never played D D, they can kind of learn along with you. You become like the avatar for the, mm -hmm. for the new player. Um, and I was like, sure. And he was like, you know, he's like, and you and Mike have similar, you know, potty mouth senses of humor. <laughs> like you'll be a good slot in for like the knockoff, the Kirkland version of Mike. And I was like, <laughs> done. <laughs> if you, if that's what you want. So, um, 
So yeah, so Jerry pulled me in and I knew Jerry and I have known Chris for a while. I've known, Tr I knew Tris a little bit um, just in like passing. And then, um, and I did, I never met Kate before mm. we started doing C team and you wouldn't know it. Yeah. But Kate's honestly at this point in my life, the one I see the most out of all of them now, Kate and I hang out like a couple times a month. Like we've gone on vacation together, like us and our families. Like, That's so uh, cool. Yeah. Like we've become really good friends. Kate's awesome. They're all awesome. They're all friends. Yeah. 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 I, but I, it was really lightning in a bottle. Like I look back and I'm like, wow, we got a really good table. We all check different boxes. Yeah. We all have like good senses of humor. We all play off each other well. And it's like, you couldn't, I, well, a lot of it was luck. A lot of it was trade up was luck. Uh, the, I, there's plenty of games out there that I've seen that have made it to air that I'm like, this, uh, this group is a little rough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah and, and you, you all definitely, yeah. Got that lightning in a ball. I do. I do agree with, uh, with Jeremy though about, uh, or, um, uh, Jerry, I don't know why I said. I was thinking Jeremy Crawford. I don't know why I was thinking that. Uh, I was. Uh, yeah. I do agree with Jerry though about like the the whole. Yeah, good guy. <laughs> Shout out to Jeremy. Good yeah. <laughs> um. Uh, about the new player experience though in in one of these shows because like the for me I started listening to Acquisitions Incorporated because I had just gotten into Fourth Edition. Like my mm -hmm. my friend, uh, we literally just started playing D and D. I somehow found the podcast for it. I, I, um, I don't even remember how I just remember ending up at my parking lot attendant job listening to it and hearing a group of people playing it for the first time really helped me understand the game better. And yeah. of course, of course you got Chris Perkins there, you know, explaining the game to you, but like being able to hear people be you know, like, like Mike being like, why am I not making a perception check all the time and, yeah. and, and, and stuff like that. I'm like, yeah, why aren't you? Um, yeah. I, I, I actually love, games where it is someone playing for the first time uh i even told some coworkers recently at cne &E, if i had to uh list like top 10 best games i've played in they're probably going to be ones that a new player is in yeah it, it, no, it's that, fun it's yeah. also like when you know what you're doing and you get to show it like <laughs> to someone who doesn't it's like listen to this band i really like yeah i, I want to watch you get excited i want to watch <laughs> you i want to watch the magic in your eyes um no, and this is this is me telling Jerry's story. So if I get any the details incorrect, it's he'll uh, come into your office and just start hitting you <laughs> because of uh, Purple Monkey Dishwasher. It's a game of telephone, but um, <laughs> to hear Jerry tell it, and again, this was before my time when they were doing when they first started uh, Ack Inc. Um, Wizards of the Coast uh, wanted to do some promotion for Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. They knew from the comics that the guys were, especially at the time, Jerry was super into D and D and they were like, Hey, help us promote fourth edition. Right. Um, and especially I never even played fourth edition, but from what I understand too, it was like, it was a lot more like world of Warcraft is how it's been explained to me. Uh, yeah. A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like definitely more MMO -y. Like those tropes. Cause the game was so hot at the time, but anyway, so it was like, yeah. T explaining the thing to people and the guys, Jerry specifically was like, hey, we should, why don't we record episodes where you listen to us play and we teach the game to Mike, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, Jerry and Scott and uh, Chris Perkins. And then they bring in Mike, who's never played, and they kind of play the game with him. And Watsy was like, no, who wants to listen to people play Dungeons and Dragons? <laughs> <laughs> and I just think that's so hilarious now yeah. because now live play is like such a huge thing. And that was pretty much the granddaddy of it all. And it's like, and now it's it's everywhere. And now Watsy is like, yes, please, more people do it. Uh, to, to think that at first they were like, no, no one wants to hear other people play. You want to play yourself. Yeah. I mean, I, I do remember hearing that like opinion though, back then. Cause like, I, I, I didn't listen to it till like 2011, but even then people were like, why do you want to listen to people play D and D? I'm like, cause I'm at work and I can't actively yeah. be playing it right now. <laughs> and it's the same. Like I always, tr when I try to get people into D and D and, or, or if they're ever like, should I play? And I'm always like, it's just improv with loose rules. Like yeah. you're just goofing around with your friends. I've been trying to get um, uh, um, uh, uh, Schwartz. Uh, oh, uh, you and I talked about this last time. Yeah. Uh, ben Schwartz. Yeah, Ben Schwartz. I've been trying to get him to play in an act Inc. or come to a pack for a minute. Incredible. He's super nice. Like every time he comes to Seattle, I like ping him. I'm like, hey. Um, but he's like nervous about it. He's like, I've never played before. 
Like you, you would be a god, dude. You, yeah. you more than anyone in the world would be immediately the best D and D player <laughs> to exist. You are an improv king. And then like, you, can, you can't win D and D, but sir, you would win D and D. Yeah, you would win it immediately, first try. <laughs> God, that'd be incredible. Yeah, especially with the Ack Inkting. Good Lord. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, well, I'll get you at a table with the guys who create it, Jeremy and Chris. <laughs> it's like, they'll keep you, you don't even got to worry about the rules too much. They'll keep you on the right track. And then you just just go off and be goofy and have fun. Like, and if you're as charismatic as Pat Roth is the table, you can get away with whatever you want. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That classic Pat Roth is bullshit. Trademark TM. Yeah. Uh, I feel like, I feel like every group has at least that one player that has the insert name bullshit TM like that. Oh, you have to. That's the best part of it. Yeah. Pushing the envelope. Yeah. Rule of cool stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so uh, get get back to Dinar. Did, do you would you say that Dinar had a uh, a character arc over the course of uh, a C team? Oh, absolutely. And I I was very conscious of it as well. Um, and I fell into the trap that a lot of new players do, where I was like, "Hey, I'm gonna write a novel for his backstory." <laughs> Instead of <laughs> that's like, never gone poorly in Acquisitions Incorporated history ever. <laughs> no, I did too. I have it. It's it's written. Uh, but like, I had a whole idea for his whole backstory. I had a whole thing I was gonna do, and and we eventually got to all the bits and pieces of his backstory. But I'm 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 a big fan of like a slow burn too. Mm. But I I had a very intentional arc in mind that we did hit with him. Um. And I feel like his character grew and he got better. And also like uh um uh he got like a little more mature as it went on. Jerry did a good job inserting um the uh uh Krenar, which was like a small dragonborn baby that they find and mm -hmm. Dinar raises for a little bit, uh, which also he had said afterwards, he was like, Yeah, because I had a newborn at home, so it was like, I was just kind of glomming on to, like, feelings you had in your personal <laughs> life. And it was smart. It was very good. It also gave me something to latch on to, like, story-wise. Because I, that first season especially, I was like, I, I didn't realize how much you were allowed to mess around with. Mm. Like, I was scared of, I didn't want to mess up the story, you know? Yeah. So I never wanted to go too weird because I was like, well, Jerry's trying to tell a story and everyone's trying to do a thing. I don't want to get in their way. Mm -hmm. And then I've mentioned this moment a million times, but it literally is when my when like the scales fell was when we were in a dungeon and Chris's character was like obsessed with this, these uh, uh, glyphs and this gate. And it's like filling with acid and it's like, you're going to die. Yeah. And we couldn't get him out. And I was getting <laughs> like legitimately real world frustrated where I'm like, there are story beats here where excuses for you to stop doing this and he's like nope my character wouldn't nope i'm not rolling good enough i stay here and i'm obsessed with it and i was like what the is happening <laughs> i was like fine leave him let him die uh and that but that was when i realized it was like no he was being true to what his character would do in the moment it's up to the dm and everyone else to like kind of like resolve the situation he was just playing true to his roots and then it was after that that i realized like no you can go wild and you should you should play play like if your character wouldn't notice something then don't you don't acknowledge it yeah. you know i yeah. i that is one thing that is is was difficult for me at the start because like my rolls are notoriously terrible like i i roll ones regularly and it, it kind of embracing the bad rolls and letting the story have uh you know go in a bad way for you so that your character can have some sort of story happen to them uh it took me a while to like really understand especially because i was behind the screen so often like i wasn't used to that sort of thing i i orchestrated where the bad stuff happened um but yeah the, seeing seeing things like that happen where it's bad roles are completely changing the the game itself like yeah. the storyline and everything it's rough <laughs> yeah and it's like I, that's like a running theme for me, and I think this is just a general cliche slash trope of anyone who plays D and D for a while. Like your your first stuff is so rigid. Like the very first game I DM'd, very rigid rules. I had a pretty rigid story written, and for the next one, which I already know, 
it's like a couple beats. Yeah. Like you want to stay flexible so that people like it might not go the way you want. And rather than trying to like shoehorn it, it's like, no, let's go. Let's explore this other direction. You have to have a lot of confidence in the other players and you got to have a lot yeah. of confidence in your own ability to resolve a story. But like that is where it gets really fun and exploratory. Same with my characters. Dinar, I wrote a, literally a novel for his backstory. And then Wooder, I wrote a couple dumb puns. You know? <laughs> like, expert players write like a handful of notes and they're like, here you go. <laughs> We'll figure well, that, it out on the fly. We'll do it live. I, I I think that was kind of like the 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 thing that broke me of that mindset because like it was definitely worse when I first started DMing. But like I eventually heard an interview with oh, with Chris Perkins where he was like, oh yeah, you know, for dice camera action, I outlined like you know like first twenty minutes and then you know yeah. we'll see what happens. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, that that's ever since doing that, it's it's been so much smoother and it's a, seeing what players do with just completely free form it's like no do it you want to blow up the prison blow up the prison i don't care whatever <laughs> i will say i i loved dming i think dming is more fun and i think it's easier than being a player <laughs> i agree <laughs> I, I get that some people like could be intimidated by it if anyone listening to this has never dm'd just try it once it's yeah. so fun and it's so easy and i think i like i appreciate the overall story more than i ever like when we would play C team, it's like I never really cared a ton about like dinar moments and stuff. I was always just like, hey, make a fart joke here or there. But I'm like, <laughs> I'm just happy to be along. I'm happy. Yeah. I'm I'm entertained. I would just want to be entertained. So I like being like the director and just watch the story. But also like if you have really good players, they're gonna be like saying stuff. <laughs> and then you just get to act like that was the plan all along. Oh and, yeah. Like, I think you're a genius. And it's like, sure. <laughs> Yep. How did you plan for this? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Planned. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Galaxy brain. That's how. <laughs> um, so I, w one of the things that I did want to talk about Dinar here was uh, the unique name and convention of Dinar's family. Yeah. <laughs> what, 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 like, did you know that when you made that last name or was that just something that kind of came about? So, um, I named I named Dinar because I had seen in like the player's hand guide that um Dinar was uh because it's like hey here's a here's yeah. your character here's kind of names you could use and there was like Dinar in there and I was like all right I was like Dinar that kind of looks like Donner <laughs> all right <laughs> Donner Blitzen is gonna be his name <laughs> And then I went through, so this is also like one of my cheats for like when I'm writing anything, uh, I will come up with not a name necessarily, but I'll come up with like attributes, like sneaky prints, right? And I'll type that in and then I'll go into Google Translate or Babblefish or something and I'll just scroll through and like Icelandic and stuff until I found, find it in another language yep. that like means that thing. And then I'm like, oh, that's cool. And then maybe I'll change it a little bit to make it sound a little more fantasy. But like, that's what I do. So that's what I did for all of his family are named after reindeers. <laughs> um, <laughs> for no reason other than a joke. It's not like it's like anything. Yeah, uh, his brother, like, his brother is part of the story is, like, brother is missing slash thought dead. His brother, Nace, it's his name, full name is Nace. It's, like, Denard dash Blitzen. Mm -hmm. And then his brother is Nace dash Rote, which is Red Nose. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he's also, like, the, the favorite son of the family is Nace. But, yeah, they're all Pran. Pran is Prancer. Yep. <laughs> that's so good i it, yeah. it's it i i enjoy the that sort of like running joke in like any kind of D, &D game not just a stream one and yeah. but i gotta say like rain santa claus reindeer naming convention with dragonborn is probably one of the most unique ones i've seen <laughs> it's i don't know you, I, and i it all just started because i was like oh that looks like donner <laughs> I just made a quick pun. Oh, Donner Blitzen. Oh, okay. Oh, Dinar Blitzen. There you go. Stretch it out. Make it a little more fantasy. Uh, <laughs> Got to get get that apostrophe in there. And make it the yeah. most uh, fantasy. <laughs> That's so uh, good. Here, I'll tell you all of the names. So here we go. Where is my? I have a an old doc <laughs> from when I did <laughs> when I wrote my novel outline. <laughs> how how, how many words would you ballpark called, that? If the mountain won't come to the dragon is what it was called. 
that is that's a good name. I was very proud of that name. I'm actually so this is well, not to veer too far off, but like this show has plenty of tangents. Don't worry, you're good. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, when I when I I actually wrote it. I was like I wrote a good backstory that I liked, and then I expanded it. And then, um, and then I was like, oh, maybe I'll write it as a novella. And then it got bigger and bigger. And then I like wrote a first draft of like a novel. But then, are it's, you like, serious? I through, and I was like, I don't like my writing. I'm I'm a self hating artist. Uh, I keep saying like, oh, maybe I'll change adapt it to a comic instead. Oh, that'd be pretty cool. But hey, yeah, you know, I, did, I always did like the name. I, I I have I have a writing podcast, so I feel like I need to say, hey, congrats on writing a draft, though. That's freaking awesome. Yeah, I know. Well, <laughs> everyone's always like, yeah, you got to crap out the first draft, and then yeah. writing editing, you're gonna have to do 50 edits, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then it's like in, and I did that, and I crapped out what was a crap draft, and then <laughs> I read it, and I hated my work so much that I was like, I can't even look at this. It's it's the meanderings of a clown. I know um, that feeling well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my, every, my... Like, there, like one in every four, I was like, all right, this is pretty good. And then the rest, I'm like, oh, what was I doing? Ugh. I, the the first draft of a book I ever wrote, I I went, this is crap. I'm never going to publish this. But I did print out a copy of it. Like I got it from like one of the self-publishing places. One copy and I put it on my shelf. Yeah. Um. But uh, all right, here we go. So it was Queen... Queen Julu, oh, I forget what that was a translation of. King Sinter is his father, which is Santa. Um, of course. Uh, Pran. <laughs> oh, it's Pran slash Serenvix. <laughs> so there we go. Pran Serenvixen. Uh, Schlager Tanzer, which translated not from German, but uh, uh, that's Pran uh, That I think it's Comet Cupid? No. Comet and Amor was Comet Cupid. Uh, that's Donner Vixen, I guess. Okay. And then you got to um, decipher your own your own code. I know. I'm like, <laughs> what are the reindeer names? <laughs> and I remember. <laughs> but yeah, it was uh, it was fun. I this is a uh, I'm looking through my outline I had of it. Mm -hmm. Thirty pages for an outline. If that puts this in hey. any sort of context. I like a, I, I like that kind of outline. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta get that thought <laughs> dump out first. Yeah. <laughs> but that's freaking cool. Yeah, I I I mean, like I I I think most of the time when people hear like, oh yeah, I wrote a novel of a backstory, people are like, oh yeah, you know, you wrote like four pages or something. You're like, no, I wrote a novel. No, I wrote a novel. It was like 250 <laughs> pages. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome, dude. That's so freaking and, cool. And where it ends is, uh, it was supposed to end right when he leaves the uh the, the city he lives in uh to go and then there's like a couple months and then he joins Zack Inc. Ah. So the idea was like it would be an approachable fantasy novel in a way mm -hmm. where it's like look even if you don't know D, D or anything like you could just enjoy it as a fantasy novel and then and then it goes from there you know that's... and then it's like hey go watch the show that's great yeah. I think that's so, yeah, I, I, I think I, you know, I, I can't sit here and say like, oh, you know, put, put that out. You know, people would love to read. Cause I, I did the same thing. I don't want people to read the crap I wrote, yeah. um, but like, you know, I, I do endure. It's like, do something with that. That, that sounds I know. really freaking I know. cool. And I'm also like the show's over. So it's like the time for this was like a couple of years ago. Eh, yeah. I, I, I think, I think there's still, still a good spot for it. That's yeah. really, really cool. Oh, I keep telling myself that. I, Chris and I talk about this all the time. Chris obviously is very talented and has fans, rightfully so. <laughs> I run a convention. I don't necessarily have like Ryan Hartman fans per se, but I'm like, he's like, you know, people would eat it up just because it's, you know, Ack Inc. related. Like you'll have a, an audience that you wouldn't have normally. And I'm like, it's true. You take advantage of that. Yeah. You're yeah. kind of starting on second base. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's true. That's true. Uh, I, I, we're, we're, we're pre-recorded, but I'm sure Chad is actually blowing up right now with people saying I would read that. So <laughs> <laughs> I probably should have said that earlier, by the way, 30 know, minutes we in. We have not mentioned we're... that it's uh, pre-recorded. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully so Chad's I... probably been very mad up until now. <laughs> Hopefully I've pinned that uh, next week when this goes out. If I haven't, <laughs> sorry. The, the, the giveaway probably just happened. So there's that. Uh, <laughs> uh right so so last year petty arcade did a very successful uh, uh kickstarter how how did that process work like wh when did that conversation start happening uh yeah about that? 
that was one that was one I put together internally. Um, I wanted to do uh, I've helped people with Kickstarters. I've been associated with Kickstarters. I was like, hey, we should run a Kickstarter. I, I'll run a Kickstarter for us. Um, and uh, I wanted to do some acting content similar to like, all right, we don't have C team anymore. Mm-hmm. We're back to just doing events at PAXs, which is cool, but I would like to do, you know, a summer series. Yeah. So we kind of identified what we wanted to do and how we wanted to do it and put it all together. And it was a lot of planning. Initially, I was trying and I was for some reason I had it in my head that I needed to do this around a PAX. Mm. Like it, it makes sense on paper. It, use it as a marketing. Yeah. Game, yeah. Know? That's when a lot of eyes are on Penny Arcade in general is around a PAX. So I'm like, all right, let me lean into that. The problem is if I'm the one running the Kickstarter and PAX, uh, that's murder. Uh, <laughs> so, like, I don't know what I was thinking. Thank God, like between like a lot of it was Laura. Laura sh- shouldered a lot of the heavy lifting. Thank God, um, and and everyone here. So it wasn't horrible. Um, but no, like the Kickstarter went great. Like I'm very happy with our results. We were able to get everything together. We got enough that we were able to partner with like a really good uh, production company called Color that do really high end stuff. So they mm-hmm. came in and they streamlined the production in a really nice way. Uh, we were able to get our friends in Jasmine and, and Xavier and uh, it it went great. I'm super happy with like everything that came out. And now um, we were trying to get a bunch of all the stuff out before unplugged, but it's starting to go out now, actually. So we launched this Kickstarter at East and now everything will have been fulfilled within a year, which was my goal. Yeah. So. So, yeah. I, I'm definitely a lot better than uh, many other Kickstarters. So. I know, I know. And I was like, we could have even gotten it under if we could have gotten everything out at end of year. But like Christmas and everything gets yeah. in the way and then Unplugged eats up a bunch of December too. So, but uh, but no, all the stuff looks great. All of our rewards came out good. I'm, I'm super happy with how it went. Would I do another one? No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I see why people hire companies to do this for them. Yeah. I'm not saying we won't kickstart something else, but I don't want to run it internally. <laughs> <laughs> That's someone fair. Else, someone else here can. Um, <laughs> no, but like now that it is all done, we have talked about like, all right, do we want to do another one? Do we want to kickstart something else? I don't know that we'll do another series or another show, or it might be a product. There's a mm-hmm. couple different ideas floating around. We'll do something. That's cool. Yeah, no. I, I mean, y'all did, uh, I mean, even just getting the stuff out within a year, like we were just saying, is, is not something every Kickstarter does. But, like, I think y'all showed really well, like, what a well-organized Kickstarter can do. Where it's just like, hey, we're getting the money now. You're, We're going to do the thing. Uh, when did that start going out? September of last year? So August? Like, um, yeah, yeah. It was right after, um, it was right after... We did a preview at West, but then it came out um, right around um, Oz, yeah, because it ran pretty much all the way to Unplugged. Um, Yeah. Because Unplugged was then the, it wasn't the finale, but Unplugged, like, the series led into Unplugged. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was also part of the plan, too, was, like, to have it fill the space between the two. Yeah, I, I, and... uh, one of the main problems I did with this was like, I should have like done the money different. <laughs> Basically every single cent we got went to either the rewards or the filming. Uh, mm. I should have like budgeted different. So there was a little money left over. Hey, for your time, pay some salaries or something. It all went back into the project. Um, but uh, it does show like, yeah, it was really, really well done. It's very clean. You you talked uh, about the, the production uh, company and stuff. Like, I mean, I, I, I know like the point of production is like not be noticed because it's just like how smooth it is. But it, that was one of the things that I first noticed was like just the app, ha- how smooth everything was, the transitions, the cuts, like everything. Yeah. It, it was so good. The editor was great. He actually does a lot of stuff with us on PAX too. He's oh, our really? videographer for PAX. Yeah. Elohim. Shout out to Elohim. He's amazing. Heck um, yeah. And it's like, yeah, color did awesome stuff. They, I mean, and this was like a pro shoot way more than we we're like, Lucy goosey also everyone that's on the show like we're all friends and we've come to paxes yeah so it's like catering you know obviously we cater and it's like make sure everyone gets some breakfast and lunches yeah. and stuff and we have coffee but they were like no we need to this is <laughs> they're used to like filming commercials for microsoft they're like no you need uh you need this and you need that it was like a real hollywood production and i was like okay <laughs> that's fine we'll do it that way but i'm like we're all just chilling out 
uh, they would come in and like, when you see people models being moved around and it cuts to like yeah. the table and then back out, what happened was we didn't have a camera on the models. We had a guy on the side marking where everyone touched when they touched it and where it went. And then after we filmed an episode, which like the episodes are like real time, they're like three hours long. And then we would cut them down, but like they would bail, you know, and everyone would go and eat and take a break and catch their breath. And while they were doing that, someone would come in and reset everything with like a, a like they bring in like macro cameras, get really oh, wow. tight views and then redo each shot like close up after we were done filming. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. Like it was, yeah. it was a pretty smart way to do it too. And then try to like finagle some third lens over someone's shoulder to get now they just well that answers a question that because like i mean that there's a couple of shows that do that and i have wondered like when that happens like yeah. is it like have they made the edits and decided which one they're going to put in but no the doing it live on set there when you know it's okay everybody leave for a moment we're going to go do this real quick that makes total sense yeah it would and it's like everyone got like half hour hour break between each episode so while everyone else was just chilling out and getting food and just relaxing like a couple of folks would stay back on the production side and yeah and like just immediately and so it was also fresh in everyone's mind and just get those shots right yeah. away and they would just go down the list and it's like all right at this point he touched this model and moved it there so someone you know i was like oh that's crazy how, how long was the was the shoot for that it was a week, um, which was great. Yeah. Uh, so we did like multiple episodes a day, but nothing too crazy. We could have even gone even shorter. Um, and uh, and then, yeah, and then Chris and Jeremy wanted to trade off, which was good because then yeah. it didn't like drain the DM um, and they would kind of keep flip flopping back and forth. So they figured out the story and how they wanted to do it. Like, I don't really when it comes to the story and stuff of this, I always am like they're they're pros beyond pros. Like yes. they can, <laughs> they literally make them, the game. <laughs> I trust them implicitly. Um, but they would, fi they figured all that out. And then, yeah. And then they came in and, and flip flopped. but yeah, we just basically shut down the studio for a week and recorded it all for a week. Um, which also makes it helpful for like Xavier when we fly him in, um, yeah. because it's like, he could do that between filming. It's why he actually couldn't make the first, uh, two episodes because, that was one day of filming yeah. and he had to film a raw. So he didn't come in till Monday night and or Tuesday morning. So that's I love the way around that too. It's like, Oh yeah. Hey, Bobby's in the bubble. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's so good. Now that, I mean, a, a week of filming. I mean, like that's, uh, is, I thinking of it from like playing D and D side, I'm like, ah, oh, that just sounds like the dream. Like you just get to play D and D with yeah. your friends, like every day for a week. Like that's, it's not a bad thing to do. <laughs> yeah, no, it was, and it was a lot of fun. And then afterwards, like, because we would break pretty early. We would break with still like time in the day and we would all get out of here at like six, seven. And then we would just go and everyone, it was funny. Like everyone kind of broke off in different groups. Like, like the one day, I think Xavier and Anna and Jasmine all went and got uh, piercings. Like he got a <laughs> nose piercing and they all, they got new piercings. Uh, the one day he and I went to the gym, he was like, yeah, Yo, you want to go to the gym? I was like, hell yeah, I want to go to the gym. Was like, a yoked professional wrestler. Yeah. Uh, so I was like, yeah, what do you want to be able to do? Um, but he was like getting into boxing. He was like, you want to go find a boxing gym? I'm like, hell yeah, let's go box. Um, but he and I hung That's out. That's so the cool. Day. Uh, uh, I think uh, like a bunch of them also went to like a dinner the one day. Like everyone kind of yeah. broke off and did like something one night, which was cool. Yeah. And then it's like, everyone's kind of breaking off and doing fun stuff together and then coming back the next day. And it's like good energy. Yeah. You feel that over the course of the week, yeah. by the time we were getting to the end of the week, like it was, it was fun. It was like the end of a year of high school. Everyone was like, Oh, I'm going to miss you. This was so much fun. That's it, so was, really, it was a lot of fun. That's awesome. Yeah. And that, and that comes through in, in, uh, in those shows. I mean, those, those are definitely some of my favorite recorded D and D I've seen in a very long time. Yeah. So you, you all yeah. knocked it out of the park. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it was fun. I and I, I won't say we won't do it again. I just yeah. don't know that we would. Kickstarting it is great because you don't have to like uh, be in the red. <laughs> Basically, we got <laughs> yeah. the money and immediately paid for production instead of like paying a production company and then making the money back. And it's like you're kind of in the red for a minute. That's the good part about uh, kickstarting stuff. But it is a pain, pain to run them. So. I don't know if we'll do another one or not, but I also don't know if like, I wonder if there's like a way we can just do it to a smaller degree yeah. here. You know, yeah. that's what I'm trying to figure out. 
Yeah, no, there, there's definitely a lot of avenues that you can go with this, but I think uh, I yeah. think Hacking fans are going to be happy no matter which uh, decision you make. Yeah. No, and there's more story to tell for sure. And we've got an open summer. We don't have a lot of stuff like... I don't have another big thing running in, the, in this summer right now. Mm. So other than we're going to redo our studio, but that's like, that's not huge. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you know, we've we've talked about packs here uh, a bit, and you know, we we have players who are are new to D and D in the the nerd world. Sometimes, what what is packs? Yeah, packs is uh, Penny Arcade Expo. Although we don't really call it that anymore, we just call it packs. Um, it's the largest consumer video game show in the United States and in Australia. We do four of them a year. Uh, we're about to have. Uh, well, when this goes live, we're, we're having it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is running like uh, right as uh, East is hitting. So, yeah, so uh, PAX East in Boston, and then we'll have PAX uh, West in Seattle in September, and then we'll have PAX Oz in uh, Melbourne, Australia in October, and then PAX Unplugged in Philly in December. And that one is special because it is, well, A, my hometown. And then uh, B, it's board game only. All of our other PAX events cover every gamut of gaming. You've got mobile gaming, PC, console, everything in between. Gaming content yep. abounds. Uh, and then, but Unplugged is just tabletop, just board games. Heck yeah. Uh, that, that is the one that I, you know, I, I imagine that having so many friends that are in the D&D space, that is, they they love PAX yeah. Unplugged. That is what they live for. <laughs> um, are uh, you all? It's, it's a fun show. Oh, yeah. Are, are you all doing a, a live show at uh, PAX East this year? We are. We are doing one. We were just uh, chatting about it, actually. Um, so, yeah, we'll do, we're, and uh, I'm waiting for the uh, design materials for it, and then we'll post it on social by the time this is running, people will have already seen it. But yeah, mm. but we'll be announcing it pretty shortly. But yeah, we're doing our we'll we'll have a live game at every packs. Like that's the plan. Um, and then the one we do in Australia is usually Cthulhu or something. We've done oh. Star Wars way back in the day um, because it's like we can't always we don't know who is going to be able to make it to Australia. Yeah, it's Australia. I mean, <laughs> Xavier to come to Australia, and it's like. <laughs> WWE is like you're gonna need him for a week. It's gonna cost a million dollars. Or it's like I'm like, all right, I guess he can't come. <laughs> um, that's fair. But yeah, but so it's like we don't ever know who's gonna be at Australia. So that's kind of like our fun offshoot game. But we've been doing for the last uh, couple years now. We've been doing Cthulhu, and Chris has been DMing, and that's been amazing. Chris is mm -hmm. so good. Chris is that's he's made for that especially that system in that world and everything like he does such a good job i i i think doing the the offshoot games like that especially at at australia is is a is a great one because i mean it is it is really cool getting to see not just other systems but to get to see you know folks that you've seen playing D D so much playing other systems in vastly different worlds like cthulhu yeah. is like yeah it's 1920s america horror like it is yep. very different from D. &D. <laughs> yeah and we always like we we had done like a C team spinoff in that sort of thing. This really isn't that it kind of is, but it's mainly just because like I play and Jerry plays and stuff. So there's like his version of Omen in that world. But it is it is fun. And I play I play a a version of Dinar, like a dumb <laughs> spoiled trust fund kid. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, hopefully he doesn't vomit up acid. Uh yeah. <laughs> Means an entirely different thing. In that yeah, world. yeah, there's a much more horrific thing in this version yeah. of it. <laughs> the coming of the old ones when he just starts doing that. Yeah. Oh, geez. Uh, well, Ryan, thank you so much for taking time today to talk with me about Dinar and Pax and Penny Arcade. Uh, if folks want to find you and what you do on the interwebs, where can they do so? Yeah, uh, well, if you ever want to find out about Pax, PaxSite.com, or we've got, you know, look up Pax on any of the socials. Um, it should be at Pax on most of them. Um, and I'm R. Hartman on uh, Twitter, and uh, I don't really get on socials too much, though. But. I feel you on that. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, definitely check out uh, Penny Arcade and PAX and all the awesome things they do over there uh, because it is some of the best entertainment that you're going to get for uh, for D and D. So please check it out. Uh, and yeah, oh, also, I mean, I, I got plugs one more time. Get, get the Dinar glitch skin that's in there because I had get a lot the of Dinar glitch skin. Watch the series we just filmed yeah. on our YouTube on Penny Arcade's YouTube. On it's actually 
we made our own YouTube channel. It's on Ack Inc. has its own YouTube channel. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Get a, get all the good stuff in one place. Uh well that's gonna do it for this week's episode of Idle Insights. So until next week, take care of yourself. <laughs>